Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Lynn. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast. How are you today? I am very well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Michael. Oh, um, thank you for kind of searching me out and, and suggesting you'd be a guest. I'm really delighted and I'm really looking forward to your subject matter um, because it really intrigues me. Uh, I want to learn more about it, become wiser on the subject too. And um, yeah, so let's get started. I, I ask my guests, my listeners are bored of this question, but I have to start with it. So uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, you. So where were you born? Have you moved around? Uh, where are you now? What about education? Um, your first job? Kind of career progression? Share as little or as much as you like. People are nosy. And then, <laughs> yeah, we'll get into the, the meat of what you're doing current day as well. Over to you, okay. Lynn. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, so I was born in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I spent um, a lot of my childhood there. And then when I was 19, I left home to go to the UK to study, uh, to study law. It was my undergraduate degree. And since then, I've had the good fortune of living in lots of different countries. I've lived in, um, of course, the UK. I live in New York. Um, I've lived in Hong Kong. Um, spent, a, spent a couple of summers in, in France. Uh, spent some time in Italy, in Germany. So I've had um, the fortune of living and working in different places, uh, and which resulted in me speaking different languages too. Um, and what I'm doing now, uh, I'm publish a book uh, called The Altruistic Capitalist this year, and I'm currently the managing director of Activate Network. Now, this is an organization that works with companies um, to increase the inclusion of women in leadership and technology roles. Uh, I'm quite excited about that. I, I'm quite passionate about businesses, um, you know, focusing on their business activities on creating a positive impact on the community uh, and the environment while still growing the business. So that is just me in a nutshell. And I'm happy to dive into any of those areas. I've just yeah, popped in little interested. nuggets here and there. <laughs> How, so what were your parents Malaysian? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So, yes. Okay, so what made them decide to send you to the UK for education? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so we, Malaysia is a, is a British colony. And so when mm -hmm. I decided to study law, um, one of the options was then to go to the UK rather than the US to study law. Um, and right. the university we picked was um, one that is uh, perhaps known uh, with Malaysian parents as being a good school to be to study law, uh, and right. that's kind of how I ended up. Um, that's how I ended up in the at the University of Nottingham. They also didn't want me to be in London. They thought I would get into too much trouble being in a big city. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's some people say Nottingham is like a small London, though, don't they? <laughs> I had a fantastic time when I was in Nottingham. Yeah. Um, the three years that I was there. Yeah, I really, I yeah, really enjoyed I, my time there. I lived in Leicester for quite a while, and that's not too far from Nottingham. We had some friends that had a shop in Nottingham, and uh, we thought that yeah, there was quite a, there's quite a buzz in Nottingham. You know, my niece was at university in Nottingham, so yeah, it's a big university town as well. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so was that a culture shock for you or was it like normal? It was like you settled in really well. Um, I think it being the whole university environment where things were set up, we were sort of cocoon and, and, um, and in a fairly protected environment. So it wasn't as big of a culture shock as say when I moved to New York. So what happened right. then? I have a fairly traditional um, to a certain extent, traditional business up um, business business training. So I graduated from Nottingham um, uh, in law, and then I proceeded to qualify as an attorney, as a lawyer. Right. And so I'm right. duly qualified, actually qualified in Malaysia, and I'm qualified in New York to practice law. 
And I practiced law for, for, for the first couple of years uh, before moving into investment banking. Uh, right. At that time, I was still in Malaysia. But um, while I was in Malaysia, I, I switched over from law to investment banking. And there I had the opportunity to go and work in Hong Kong. And um, from there, the, the, the bank in Hong Kong then sent me to New York. And that was actually when I had if you like my first big culture shock when I went to when I moved to New York I was uh, five minutes away from uh, five minutes by by foot um, away from Fifth Avenue was like the for me a really big shock to to work in a, a city and live in a city like Manhattan um, and having grown up with American culture and American movies and American music I, I, it, it was a little bit of a shock that I had to figure out how um, how to maneuver and navigate through the city on my yeah. own as an adult, which is a little bit different than when you are in the whole university um, student environment. Yeah. Okay. So, right. I'm I'm help me with the timeline just a little bit because. Mm -hmm. So you were born in Malaysia, then you did most of your studies there, then went to the UK for university. Yes. Then after the UK, you went to Hong Kong, did you say, or did you then go to New York? Which way around was it? Oh, so I was actually back in, um, so I went back from the UK, I went back to Malaysia to complete right. my legal studies. And my first job as a lawyer was actually in Malaysia. Oh, And, and when I was in Malaysia, I switched over to finance and to investment banking. Um, and right. from there, I moved to Hong Kong, and from Hong Kong, I moved to New York. So I was um, mid twenties when I was in, in in New York. Gosh, that's when quite I first young, to... isn't it? To yeah. wow, yeah. I mean, it's quite young to have been a lawyer already at that age, and then uh, yeah, <laughs> wow, fantastic. And um, you were comp you were working still for the investment bank there yes yes i was working okay. for an investment bank in in um in new york when i first moved there mm -hmm. right and how long did you stay with them um i think i was there for about a year and then i decided i would do my mba um and to mm. have a slightly different experience to talk about in my mba application i thought i would go into um restructuring consulting and so that was uh, that meant having a, a consulting experience to write about, to talk about uh, the uh, running of businesses and how I could turn around um, business, uh, turn around companies. So I did that, I think, for a year, maybe a year and a half um, before I moved and, and did my MBA. And then after my MBA, um, I went back into investment banking. So I was, uh, there was a there was a short pause between my investment banking career where I went into consulting so I could talk about that um, right di distinguish myself um, in my MBA application oh okay and then the second stint, stint or period in investment banking was mm -hmm. for how long uh, that was probably for about two years oh, that okay. was after my MBA mm -hmm. right yeah right. and then what made you leave uh, uh, that was um that uh, is a good question michael um that was a difficult um choice uh in my life actually so what happened was this was may of 2012 um i was working on the ipo for facebook helping them go public working on a lot of uh working with a lot of tech startups actually to help them raise public financing and what happened at that point in time was um, my grandmother was very ill in malaysia uh, i wanted to go home to see her to spend time with with her and my family um, and ultimately i was told no because facebook was about to go public um, and so i was put into a very difficult position and in conflict of whether or not to go back and spend time with my family um, or to you know stay back with um at work and, and, and complete the and complete the whole transaction and ultimately yeah. I, I stayed back um, mm -hmm. I mean, Facebook went public. Uh, my grandmother passed away. I did not have the opportunity to go back um, for Aww. a funeral even. Yeah, it was a very difficult time for me. Um, and I mm. felt quite bad and quite guilty about 
what I did and the decision that I made. Um, uh, but it also raised a lot of questions for me at that time. Um, like what, uh, what is the legacy that I've, I'm leaving behind? Yeah, I'm doing interesting work. I'm helping companies raise public financing. But ultimately, what is, um, what is the impact that uh, I would like to have? Uh, I could mm. have a bigger paycheck. I could have promotions every year. But I, I felt like what I was doing at that point in time um, wasn't, wasn't creating a positive impact per, perhaps on, on community or, and on the environment as well. And you know, in investment banking, I studied, I spent hours at, at work uh, looking at financial statements, but it wasn't mandatory for companies to report, for instance, what was the impact on communities, how much were they investing in, in the local communities or how much they're investing in sustainability or circularity type programs to support or, or regenerate the environment. Um, so those were the questions that, that were circling in my mind uh, in the mid, uh, mid 2012 when I was um, considering to leave investment banking which I did in the end uh, I decided that I wanted to take a different direction in my career to yeah. see how I could perhaps if you like find my purpose um, how I could create more impact within communities how I could um, leave leave um, leave uh, a, a legacy behind to yeah. positive impact um, uh, the people in my life. And, okay, I, I get it. And I'm still amazed because you must have been still quite young. <laughs> you, are, you are still quite young. <laughs> that you got that realisation quite early on in your life, really. Um, because... Most people, I mean, things are speeding up on the planet, I know. And, you know, I didn't wake up till I was in my mid 40s in terms of, you know, what positive impact might I be making in the world? Um, not suggesting everybody should, of course. Um, but there is a point in time, whether you call it midlife crisis or, you know, <laughs> what is it all about? What is all the mm -hmm. money? kind of earning all about you know getting a bigger car getting a bigger house getting bigger holidays you know um it's you know it's a wake-up call really isn't it like that and so you got that at quite a young age why do you think that was i think um Perhaps it was because of what had happened with, I had to choose between um, duty to my family and um, duty to, to my work. And I, I love my work. I'm very proud of what I deliver to my clients and, and, to, mm. and how I help my team. But I also, uh, my family is also very important to me. Um, and I didn't feel like I needed, I should make a choice between the two. Um, ultimately there should be a balance uh, yeah. between life and, and, and work, personal life and work. Uh, and so that's why I, I, I sought out to um, find something to do work that, that had meaning uh, or, or uh, were more in line with my values, perhaps. I also saw some behaviors um, with, with people around me, the people I work with, some of whom were perhaps stuck in that cycle of con consumption uh, of yes. buying more and more things. And that didn't quite resonate with me. And I don't want to be part of that. Um, no. So, yeah, that's uh, perhaps perhaps that's why. I, I, I grew up in a fairly modest uh, circumstance in, in Malaysia. Uh, and already what I had experienced, and I, I really am quite fortunate, Michael, to have been given the opportunity, you know, from a... From uh, from Kuala Lumpur to move to Hong Kong, um, and yeah. then the opportunity to work in New York. I never expected that. Um, no. Uh, also, the opportunity to to study in the UK. I consider myself very fortunate to have yes. these different experiences. Um, uh, in, in my twenties, these you know to move in different countries in within my twenties. Um, so. I suppose perhaps that also accelerated some yes. uh, some of the things that I, I saw, some of the lessons that, that I learned um, earlier on compared to others. 
Yeah. Hats. Yeah. Okay. So thank you for painting that picture. And then once you left that job, mm-hmm. um, did you have something to go to or you said, I'm leaving and I'm going to search for something else? What, what happened? So I search for I search for something else while while I was considering um, also to understand my the options that I have and I looked yeah. for roles that were then related to innovation and technology because as I mentioned I was working within with with tech startups. Yes. Now ultimately I found something and I uh, ended up at Estee Lauder, um, uh, and the other thing that I did so I didn't just I look for an alternative for for career. And that was a big salary cut. That was a really big salary cut. It was like 30, 40%. I don't remember the exact numbers now, but it was a 30, 40% salary cut um, compared to what I was earning in investment banking. Uh, but then the other portion of my time, I wanted to invest then in, again, giving back. And I started to volunteer um, to mentor uh, women, um, whether it's students or um, younger younger women within um, young women professionals who wanted advice in terms of how they could navigate their careers. So I did different things like that to also try and give back to, to the community. I started thinking about how is it that I want to give back and yeah. experiment it with different organizations. And you did that in your own time then? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Outside of um, my working hours. Yes. Your working hours. But what role did you do? Did you say Estee Lauder? I was with yeah. Estee Lauder in New York, yes. So what role did you do there? I was within the e-commerce business, uh, right. and that was um, helping them think about how is it that we could grow the business um, from a technology standpoint um, without um, growing the growing more the bottom line rather than the top line. How is it that we could help grow profitability through technology and innovation? Cool. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. How long did you stay there for? <laughs> uh, I think that was about two years as well. <laughs> you okay. might start to see a pattern. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that yes, I was at SDL order for about two years. Mm-hmm. It's there's um, we we'll probably haven't got. Oh well, shall I share the story? It's a very quick story. In in my go on then. I was I was uh, working in textiles. Well, I worked in textiles for like twenty eight years, but I wanted to get out of it, and I was I wanted to come back to the UK. At the time, I was working in Ireland, and I got an interview with Estee Lauder, right mm-hmm. in the UK, like in this near Surrey somewhere. They have an office there. So I went to the interview, and the guy that was HR person. I think was interviewing me. Um, this is a long time ago now. Um, my English probably wasn't as good as it is today, um, and I've probably been in outside of the Netherlands for about five, six years, say. And anyway, he said, "Have I got any experience?" Now imagine, Estee Lauder, a lot of products come in pots, right? Now, this gentleman was Irish, right? And he said, do you have any experience in potaging? I said, excuse me? What? Pardon? What did you say? He says, do you have any experience in potaging? Potaging? What? I was thinking (laughs) in my mind, he meant putting stuff into pots, potaging. You know, (laughs) I've never heard of this word in my life. (laughs) <laughs> and he had to repeat it four times and it was actually the word he was saying was purchasing you know well I didn't have any experience in purchasing but this strong Irish accent came out potaging do you have any potaging and I oh I made this stupid word up in my mind I mean needless to say I didn't get the job <laughs> oh god <laughs> oh no yeah and I was so I sad would not have because, got that as well no I was so sad because I mean first of all I didn't come for a purchasing job I came for a planning job or something because I was in planning mm. at the time um but mm. my girlfriend at the time she used 
loads of Estee Lauder products. So we were very disappointed because she was just wishing for all the <sighs> discounts that she could get on Estee Lauder <laughs> and Clarins. Right, and yes. Else. Oh, dear. Yeah. So mm-hmm. when you said Estee Lauder, yeah. just that memory just flooded back in my head. Um, okay, mm-hmm. so a couple of years with Estee Lauder. Where did you go after that? After that, I ended up in Germany. And this is when I was at Adidas, um, again, oh. on a innovation, innovation strategy role, looking at the different partnerships that we could have with startups, that Adidas could um, build with startups in order to create more innovative and uh, innovative products and services for the consumer. And at this time, we were also quite focused on um, sustainability. Um, you know, the, the belief at, at the brand at Adidas is through sports, we have the power to change lives. And so that is, how is it that we can help athletes perform better uh, in their sport, bring, bringing their best selves to sport? How is it that we can help them um, uh, have better mental health as well to keep them moving to stay yes. healthier for longer so that it can um, exercise but also from an environmental perspective um, what is it that we can do to support the um, support the communities to have an environment to do sports in because if our um, um, rivers and our uh, oceans are polluted then we don't have places to swim uh, we no. don't have places to to do water sports and the same um, with um, on land, we, if we our our uh, if we have all the landfills uh, around us, then there's no space to actually do sports, to play football or um, a- a- anything like that, to run, yes. to run and to breathe safely and healthily. So mm-hmm. um, so that was that was one of the the things that drove innovation and our choice for partnerships with startups. Which right. are the startups then that we could partner with that. Uh, we can create products that are more sustainable um, and that could also um, help athletes perform better. Wow, that sounds amazing. So what that project that that you were part of of Adidas, was that a new project they were doing that you that you headed up? That was a part of the strategy um, at that point in time at Adidas. Um, it was called the open source strategy. How is it that we can collaborate and I, I and that's one of um, the tenets of of the book as well the artist is capitalist how is it that we can co- collaborate and work with others in order that we can create and scale impact um, so this open source strategy was then looking um, for partners whether it was larger corporations or smaller startups which I was more looking at um, to create a, to create innovative products that have a positive impact on the athlete or the environment. So an example of one was um, a collaboration that we did with Carbon 3D, uh, and that's a 3D 3D printing uh, company that's based out in California where you we could print the midsole. And Adidas has a technology to measure the gait of um, an athlete's run. So how, how uh, how high do you run and how heavy, where does your foot fall in order to customize a printed, uh, print a customized midsole to suit that athlete. So with this collaboration, then in theory, um, Adidas would able to enable um, athletes to perform better to their, yeah. to their best, to their base, best capabilities because of this, because of uh, a customized midsole. Yeah. But the technology was also good in the sense that um, it had lo- it produced lower waste because it's three right. D printed, and I never seen it was very exciting. Um, the technology with carbon three D, very exciting technology. Um, three D three D printing traditionally, it's um, a little bit like your dot matrix printer, if you That's remember, right. yeah. where you print like um, a layer upon layer. Yes. And what they have uh, patented is um, where you have your liquid material in a and in a bucket at the at the bottom, um, in the in the background of the software, you have the image, the digital image of the product of the item that you want to print, and what it does, it, it solidifies 
the, the liquid using UV light and oxygen so that there's no, um, that's not a layer by layer type printing of the finished product. So from a performance perspective, particularly when you're talking about um, a product like a, a, a item, a, a piece like the midsole, where it's quite important for an athlete's yeah. performance that you don't want any, um, any weakness in the, in the joints. Let's, right. let's just say. And so um, Carbon 3D was a really interesting um, collaboration that we would, we would be able to deliver something that enhanced the athlete's performance, but also was a lower waste, uh, a lower impact in terms of waste produced in the manufacturing of the, of the midsole. It was, um, it used less resources, but it could also produce less waste because traditionally we would have the the injection molding, which had a lot of wastage. Wow. Sounds that that way was we're very technical. I am very, <laughs> I hope, I hope that was clear enough. <laughs> I think we're all going to be looking now online to see what it looks like. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a really cool technology. Uh, yeah. I'm a little bit, uh, I, I really like tech. Uh, I'm a little bit of a tech geek. Um, and when I saw this, this was for me, I thought it was like really cool, very sexy, in fact, for 3D printing <laughs> technology. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds amazing. Sounds amazing. How long were you with Adidas for? <laughs> so I was with Adidas for about three years. And then at that okay. point in time, I thought, uh, so, you know, I had, I had been involved in this, um, thinking about, okay, what's the impact that I want uh, that, that Adidas could create with, the, with these different collaborations. Um, and I also remember back when I was in investment banking and I was leaving investment banking, I was thinking more of the what is the legacy that I want to leave behind? Yes, yeah. And then, um, so when it came to that time, and I'm someone who loves learning, who loves challenging myself. And when I got to that time at, at Adidas when I had you know, done a lot of um, interesting, cool, cool projects, uh, including developing a framework as to how we were able to measure the impact of how Adidas was changing right. the lives of others. Um, I thought to myself, well, what, how is it that I'm changing the, the life of others as well? Yes. Um, and I, I also um, hinted a, a little bit earlier in our conversation, I, I had focused a lot on mentoring other women and helping them yes. in their careers. Um, and a, a, a program that started a few years back then was um, to work, uh, and this was the, the, the genesis of, of Activate then, um, helping bringing together women uh, mentors um, to act as role models for students in secondary school and high school and how they could then um, mentor and coach these girls in in school um, to help them understand the different career opportunities but also be role models for the girls because right. i believe if uh, if they can see um someone who is successful in their personal life um, as well as in their professional life, they can aspire that, to that too. I think it really yes. helps to, to, you see it, then you can be it, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I left Adidas to start my own organization, which is Activate Network, because mm -hmm. I wanted to leave that, that legacy behind. I wanted um, to have uh, lots of, uh, I wanted to have, I wanted women to, feel like they could fulfill their highest potential, that they could yes. choose, they, they had different opportunities available to them um, and that they would create a cycle of women mentoring others. So mm. I'm not precious about keeping this concept to myself. I mean, it would be wonderful if people took this idea of, you know, putting women and students together to work on, um, on, on a project and from there, the girls get inspired to also focus on their own personal careers, but careers in uh, in different areas. Um, yes. So, so that's that's when I decided I, I would leave Adidas and focus um, on try uh, on making Activate uh, a business um, to to well because it creates business value for companies, but it also creates a social impact for the high school students. Okay. Right, so <laughs> loads of questions now in my yeah. head that pour through. First of all, massive round of applause for you doing that and amazing, amazing work and so, so necessary. Um, the, 
the idea is amazing, but how did you get it started? What, you know, there, there, okay, there may be some other companies doing similar things, but this was a unique new idea of yours to work with companies and have the women in those companies mentor these school kids. Um, how did you get started? Did you create the business? Did you create, you know, a vision, mission, a website first? Who was your first client? Uh, did you get any rejections along the way? Did you get any pushback? <laughs> what, how did it all go? Yeah, uh, lots of questions there. Uh, I, I mean, I don't remember which is which is best in terms of website or what, but what um, helped me, I believe, was a uh, warm introduction to to the companies. And so um, one of the companies that I work with is, is Pearson. It's an education company, and that was a warm introduction. Yes. Um, right. The other thing that I think has helped is because I had also done some of these programs prior to um, prior to it being Activate Network in its in its yes. form, I had, I had brought together women to mentor and coach um, students. But the difference now is that um, the women and the students. This is a mentoring slash coaching program plus. What the mm. plus is that the students and the women are working on a business problem that the company has. So right. it could be um, something that's related to sustainability or something that's related to um, how is it that we deliver new products to the next generation of consumers, whatever that is. Because I believe there is, um, uh, there is value when um, the older generation works with the younger generation. And we will have that in the workplace. We will have multiple mm. generations working together. Um, and how is it that we can bring the creative energy, perhaps, of the younger generation and the wisdom of the older generation to create better products and better services. Yes. So, and that's what these programs deliver. It, um, it has a safe space and it creates an understanding be between the different generations to work together. Because they also start to see, the women also start to see themselves in, in, in the student side. This is, this is how, how I was when, when I was that age. These were some of the challenges that I faced. Um, yes. And it helps them reflect on, oh, this is how I've evolved as well. And this is, um, and this is how, uh, how I can help that, that student. It, it, uh, it, it helps women become better <laughs> leaders in, in that sense. Um, and, and so, again, the value for the business is that they create this business value. It also enhances the confidence that the women have as managers and leaders in their own, in the workplace. Wow. And for what, where is the financial model for this kind? This is not voluntary, is it? Or how, no. how does this work for the organization? And do, do they pay into you as a business or a social enterprise? Or which way around is it? They pay a fee to participate in this program to 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 have these programs delivered because each program is customized for the business. It's right. so it's um, uh, what um, which um, which of the employees do they want to have involved in this program? Um, what yeah. is the business problem that they want to solve? So while the modules uh, to a certain extent uh, are, are standardized, but we customize these modules particular the the, the 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 program particular to the company what is the business problem that they yes. want to solve what is the group of um, employees that they want to to help as well um is right. it across across geographies is it across seniorities and we find that across seniorities it also helps with the organization because then it um uh, the women can then build the relationships they can find sponsors they can find their own mentors within an organization that they might not necessarily be exposed to because this is taking them outside their usual day-to-day -day work, their day-to-day -day yeah. role. They get to meet women in the organization that is not that is not necessarily part of 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 who they would come across with. Um, and I think that is quite important to increase that uh, point, the different points of contact with um, with people who are different from from us. Uh, when we are able to to interact with people from different backgrounds. I, I think hmm. we can learn uh, more um, 
to to see different points of view and that helps us become more creative and innovative yeah absolutely okay and how long have you been doing this now this has been um close to three years then it's a lot of fun i yeah yeah i enjoy it i enjoy it Mm -hmm. i can see by the smile on your face that you're enjoying it and and um, what's the uptake you know are you and what kind of companies where across the world or is it just in the usa what's the kind of footprint of it all the the positive thing that came out of the pandemic actually well a couple of positive things that came out of the pandemic when it first happened um uh, the programs were originally um in person um Mm. with that um with the pandemic the schools of course students couldn't go into the schools um no. they were still learning how to how to figure out how to use how to study from how to how to learn from home and so yeah. the programs took a pause for a second um and because of that uh, it's now evolved to become 100% virtual so it can be with i could work with any company activate can work with any company across the organization because the students have also now learned and adapted to doing things online and we've yes. um, we've now done two cohorts um, completely online and that's um, that's worked very well um, the other thing that's come out that has uh, been birthed in the pandemic is of course uh, the altruistic the altruistic capitalist um, the book that happened because while I was um, uh, in the lockdown with everyone else I live alone um, had mm. this time on my hands and I could have um, had way too much wine to drink and instead I decided I would experiment a little bit. I experimented on being teetotal so I didn't have alcohol for <laughs> all the time in, in lockdown. I didn't have any caffeine. I became vegetarian and then I also thought well I'll experiment um, and, and write this book uh, because I, taught, I, I thought about being an author for a while. Uh, yeah. And so I thought, okay, well, this is a good a time as any to to write a book and be an author. Uh, and so that's kind of what happened. Wow. <laughs> that's, and so where did the idea come from for this book, which is called The Altruistic Capitalist? Yes. Yes. Indeed. Yes. How to lead for purpose and profit. And what I saw, and it was a difficult time, I believe, for everyone, um, mm. uh, being locked down, being separated from families, not knowing what the pandemic was uh, was going to bring and how things would end, um, vaccinations, um, mm. people not having enough equipment, um, uh, not, not having enough hospital beds. Mm. But I also mm. saw at that time um, a lot of humanity and kindness neighbors helping each other to buy yeah. groceries, uh, people coming out on their balconies in the evening to applaud the frontline workers, which I thought was really quite nice. Um, yeah. And the other thing that made me um, feel hopeful and inspired um, in, in the end to write this book was how companies came together with public organizations, whether it was nonprofits or governments, to create solutions. How is yeah. it that we can adapt our uh, operations or what we have in our business um, to supply more beds, to supply more um, uh, respirators, to um, to give, to build more masks, uh, and to help all of us get yeah. through this pandemic. There was a lot of collaboration. There was a lot of sharing and knowledge to try and get to a vaccine, to get to a solution, to make things um, pass as quickly as possible. Yeah. So I was very hopeful about that. And so that's why that mm. one of the elements of the book is, is also about collaboration, because I really feel that in order for us to get through climate change to, or, or at least mitigate some of the harm of, of some of the harms and dangers of climate change, of mm. discrimination, the homelessness, um, access to clean water, education, things like that, we need to work together. It's yes. not the responsibility solely for governments, for nonprofits, or, or for businesses alone. We all need to pull together, and we all need to come together um, and to realize uh, 
our own place, our own role in solving these problems. And I think mm. we all can do something, uh, even if it's as simple as sharing the story. Hey, listen to what I did today. I, I um, bought from this company because I read about them and how they were employing um, people who were pre previously incarcerated and how they plow back all of the profits back into um, reducing recidivism. Uh, sorry that I messed that word up, but reducing the people who are going back into um, uh, going back into the justice scene, the, the, the yes. penal system, for instance. Yes. Uh, and so I, 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 I think we all can do something um, to mm. in order to help with that, uh, and it starts with collaboration. So uh, to go back to your question, Michael, and that was a really long answer. How I was inspired to write this book was um, mm. the, the the pandemic and how companies came together with right. other organizations um, yeah. to solve to solve the the problem of the pandemic. So that explains the kind of altruistic thing. Mm -hmm. Where does the capitalist thing come from? Uh, so I was playing around with the title. Um, mm. A lot of us have an idea uh, uh, of what capitalism is. Um, there's a big yes. distrust um, in the US and in the UK of what capitalism it is, uh, what big business is. Um, uh, and I think it stems from the belief that Oh, it's all about making money. And to a certain extent, that is true. For a long time, uh, businesses were operating on the principle of shareholder capitalism. This is something that Milton Friedman talked about uh, in the 1970s. The responsibility of businesses is to increase profits. Yeah. Uh, but in recent years, um, in, in 2019, actually, um, the Business Roundtable um, had a meeting and there were 200 global CEOs that said, well, no, what is important right now, the responsibility of businesses is to create value for all its stakeholders, not just its shareholders and investors, but for its customers, for its environment, for the environment, for its employees, also for the supply chain partners, the people that you work with in order to deliver the products and services um, of the business. And so that has come, that has created this shift, um, that has created the shift now in the community um, towards stakeholder capitalism. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and so I wanted the title, I, I, what I wanted to create in the title altruistic capitalism is to counter that. Well, it's not about just, just yourself, just for creating money and creating, increasing profits for the business. There is this movement where we are also creating uh, investing in areas which is not for the business directly. You're investing in the environment, for instance, investing in regenerating the environment, um, investing in the local communities, whether it's um, creating more jobs, um, uh, uh, investing in employees so that there's improved well being at the workplace. There are all yes. these things that companies are doing in order to create business value. So it's um, to a certain extent altruistic, but I will argue. If you create business, if you create value, a positive impact for your employees, for the communities, ultimately it leads to um, financial performance for the businesses as well. Yeah, hundred percent. But it's, it's. I'm glad that what you're saying is starting to happen. You know, when I was in employment, there was none of that. When I left employment, one of the things I wanted to do was help people in organizations with their wellness. Mm. And because I trained in that, it's not what I do today. But okay. and then one of the reasons was, A, I started to promote it in during the recession of 2007, mm. 08, mm -hmm. and nobody wanted to know. But nobody wanted to know because they didn't want to spend the money on their mm. employees Mm -hmm. to help them with their mental health or their physical health or mm -hmm. anything. You know, wellness were in the workplace was not a buzzword that people were interested in. It was something that belonged to government to look after, not businesses to spend on, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but we're still, I mean, I mean, the two topics that you, 
are passionate about, which is women succeeding in life and in business mm -hmm. and businesses being more altruistic in their capitalism and actually providing more value for society at large. These are probably the biggest problems in the world today. <laughs> and I, I, I'm sure I saw a report not that long ago that, you know, the gender pay gap is still far too big, you know, across the board between men and women. It's just obscene. And it's so wrong. You know, even as a man, I'm saying that it's always been wrong and it's still wrong. Why haven't they fixed it? Why have men not fixed that, for example? You know, why haven't they? Why aren't there more women around the boardroom tables? Um, it's, it's not great. Uh, and sometimes, you know, I'd say this honestly to my wife. Sometimes I'm embarrassed to be a man because, you know, men, are they cause a lot of trouble in the world. So then the other, the whole kind of providing for society um, can't be done until organizations, I'm a bit on my pedestal here because I'm very passionate about it, as you are, mm -hmm. until organizations stop kind of chopping money from the top line, the bottom line, the sideline, and put it in tax havens in bogus companies to not get taxed on the profits until that stops then they are not being serious about it you know because putting money in your tax haven means that you do not want that money to go to society mm -hmm. and society needs that money you've earned that money from society so you now need to give that money where it belongs and get taxed on it and you know the, the poor workers that are working for these organizations are being taxed. So why aren't the companies doing their duty? So it's a, it's a big nut to crack. And mm -hmm. uh, I wish you so much success with your book. And th it's amazing. And so tell us where people can find the book, first of all, because I think people need to read it for sure. Um, <laughs> Where can, we, where can people find it? Do you have a website or do they just go on Amazon or? You can, um, you can, I have a website for the book. It's called the altruistic .com, and you can purchase the book on Amazon. Um, you can also, I'm happy to listen um, to, to, to connect with the audience and readers anytime. Um, you can connect with me directly at Lynn, L Y double N at altruistic capitalist.com. Happy to sign you, uh, uh, happy to send a signed copy of the book. If wow. you email me, uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I am very, um, I'm very excited when I hear directly from readers and from the audience saying, oh, I heard this on the podcast. Uh, I have this question. I'm happy to send a signed copy of, of, um, to, to, to readers and audience for that because that helps me as well learn yeah. um, from others what they are seeing, what, uh, what they are observing around them. So yeah, happy to do that for the listeners. Brilliant. That's brilliant. I'll definitely highlight that in the, in the show notes. Um, so what what's the what's the mission then is this where do you see yourself in i don't know 5 10 15 20 years is it some are you somebody who might be interested in going into politics oh that's a good question michael i have not had anyone ask me that before um probably not politics i'm not i'm mm. not sure if i that's a good one, though. That's an idea. Mm. <laughs> um, at, the, at this point in time, I, I, I don't see myself as a politician. I've, I've not been involved in that sense. Um, no. What I, I, I think I would still be involved in, though, in five to ten years is, is still trying to create a positive impact for the community. I think I would still be involved in education. How is it that we can give the next generation of women leaders a better opportunities, more access to education um, uh, in order okay. that they can achieve what about their a, dreams. 
What about a school then? Oh, I like, like that a, idea as well. <laughs> a proper school for all this. For both, yes. for both topics, you know, like a, I mean, it could be an online school, of course. You could have your own online academy, but you could also have a physical school, you know, where people come in person and, um, and these women get educated and, and then also one part of the school would be the kind of altruistic capitalism kind of school as well. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I like that. I, <laughs> what I like about that idea is the idea of community um, yeah. and the women who have graduated or the people, the, 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 the students who have graduated, they come back and they, and there's a, you know, the whole alumni idea, yes. uh, it creates it perpetuates that, that paying it forward um, concept. Absolutely. I, yeah. I really believe in, in that um, to pay it forward, to help the next generation um, achieve their fullest potential. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Lynn, is, is there anything that I haven't asked or that we haven't covered that you would like to share? And then if there is something, please share, then also please share where people can find and connect with you. Thank you for the, the email, but are there any other areas where you're active that people can connect with you online? Uh, I am also on Instagram uh, at the altruistic capitalist. Um, in terms of last words, I guess, um, what I like to ask people is, you are never too small to create an impact. Um, if you think you're too small, try sleeping with a mosquito. Um, we. <laughs> We can. We all have. A, we all have the power. We have the power to choose who we buy from, who we work with, who we invest in, and we have the power to share the story. Uh, um, like I mentioned earlier in the program, of who, maybe we learn about a company that is creating a positive impact. We can share that story story at dinner, and and also create an impact that way because we don't know how it will influence the other person to think about how they're doing things, how they're leading their life, and how they want how they're being. So mm. I, I like to say no one is ever too small to create an impact. Um, just, just be conscious about the things that we're doing on a daily basis. I love it. I love it. But last question, before we press record, we had a bit of a pre-recording chat and you mentioned that you speak eight languages. Yes, at varying levels. <laughs> at varying levels. Okay, share with us what are those languages? Mm -hmm. So I grew up in Malaysia, and so I grew up bilingual, Malay and English. So those are yeah. two languages. Um, yeah. I also speak Cantonese, which is a Chinese dialect that we speak in Kuala Lumpur. Um, yeah. German, because I lived in Germany. France, because one of the companies I work with was, was French, and I wanted to know what people were speaking about at the, yes. <laughs> at the cafeteria. Um, Italian, because I had spent a few months um, at um, a startup accelerator. Um, mm -hmm. Spanish and Catalan, because I've spent wow. some time in Barcelona. So eight. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. Very kind of European flavor, that's for sure. Yes. Oh, that's incredible. <laughs> and the other thing you mentioned as well, which hasn't come out, you mentioned something about piano playing as well when you were very young. Yes, indeed. Uh, I started the piano. I started learning the piano when I was five and I studied it for 12 years. So I think wow. that has something to do with um, the way I'm able to to speak multiple languages. I mean, first I, I yes. grew up, I was I grew up speaking at least two lang three languages, actually. And so I think that helps with learning new languages. But mm. um, also because I study at the piano, I think I'm also quite tuned in or I have um, I'm more sensitive to, to sound or... Yes. Uh, that's, a, that's a theory. I've not actually looked into that. I don't know the, the, the intricacies of, of mm. language learning, but perhaps that has helped me. Uh, and if you hear me sometimes, if I'm speaking to an American person, I sound a little bit more American than perhaps I'm sounding <laughs> right now. <laughs> that's so interesting. Um, uh, amazing. I just wanted to, for the listeners to hear some of those personal things I thought was really incredible. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I, I look forward to hearing more about your journey and following you on social to see where it's all going. 
I wish you so much luck with your mission, both the book and the Activate Network. Um, they really sound really great initiatives. Well done to you. Thank you so much, Michael. <laughs> Take care for now. Bye bye. Yeah. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.